You are listening to The Hero's Journey. I'm Dan Zarzana. And I'm Jeff Garvin. Let the journey begin. Dan, we could do our normal prelude discussion about this episode's film, Shaun of the Dead. But what I think we really need to discuss is our individual levels of zombie preparedness. Dan, how defensible is your home? Hmm. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being a cardboard box in the middle of a cemetery parking lot, (laughs) and 10 being a abandoned but fully stocked military bunker, I'd probably have to say I'm maybe at about a four. Uh, Whoa. (laughs) Nice knowing you. Yeah. I'm on the third floor of my apartment complex, and I do have an isolated rooftop deck that's only accessible from the outside via ladder, and zombies don't climb ladders as far as I know. Hmm. But my apartment is the first one in the hallway. So once the zombies find their way up to the third floor, my door's probably the first one they'll try to breach. Let me ask you this. From that deck, do you have a clear shot at the hallway that leads to your door? No, not really. I mean, there's one of the hallways, yeah. But there's another hallway inside the building there's two stairwells on each side and i i only see one of them so it would not be sufficient i would have to rely on the neighbors on the other side of the building to keep that end safe and i that's i just can't plus your next door neighbor is really loud right so the zombies might go straight <laughs> might go straight to their door that's true they might hear the food over there and as long as I just keep quiet maybe I'll be all right well in any case it sounds like you'll run out of supplies before the zombies actually get to you yeah and then I'll have to do what dooms every group of survivors in a zombie movie leave my shelter for supplies right every movie I've ever seen every zombie novel I've ever read the only medium where leaving shelter leads to successes in video games it seems left for dead dead rising dead island dying light I hate that game. <laughs> what about you, Jeff? Are you prepared to defend your family against the zombie horde? Uh, I'm really not. I would have to make it to Scott's house if I want me and my family to survive. Uh, although we do have quite a bit of canned <laughs> food, we are right up against a hillside and our garage and house faces the street. So we are the equivalent of the low hanging brain fruit at this point. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight now that you brought that up because zombies zombies really stress me out. How would you explain that to your therapist? Um, I wouldn't in case he becomes a zombie and then remembers that I'm an easy target. <laughs> wow. Well, I think the only way for you to get over this irrational fear of yours is immersion therapy. <laughs> so grab your cricket bat. Collect a bouquet of flowers for mum. It's time to get some red on us. And take a bite out of Shaun of the Dead. Every hero's journey begins with the ordinary world, where we see our main character in their status quo normal life. Shaun is a 29-year-old ambitionless electronics sales advisor in London. He is unusually dedicated to his hilarious but freeloading best friend Ed and slightly neglectful of both his mom, Barbara, and his dissatisfied (laughs) girlfriend, Liz, uh, whose friends don't like him. Sean is stuck in a loop of work, pub, home, work, pub, home, and doesn't seem motivated at all to make any changes in his life. Basically, he he lives like a zombie. He is of the dead. So I think that's Sean's ordinary world. I love that opening scene. It sets a great comedic tone. Oh, man. Of, of them in the bar, Sean and Liz having their little conversation. Of, yeah. It's not that I don't like Ed. Ed, it's not that I don't like you. <laughs> right. They keep <laughs> revealing characters as though... He's just standing right there. I love how Edgar Wright shows the world that we live in, too. You know, there's that one shot of people shuffling down the street in sync. 
they're not zombies yet, but it's kind of showing how the everyday world is filled with people who are unaware of what they're doing and seem intentionless. And there's even one shot where people are looking at their phones, at their tiny little Nokia uh, dumb phones. And I thought, right, if that were 2020, everyone in that shot would be staring at their phones. So it was it was an interesting little peek into the quaint technological world of 2004. So it seems like you're started you're ending the world of common day here. Yeah. Which means that you are including the challenge of Liz to spice things up as a call to adventure. I had a feeling that you and I were going to be a little out of sync on this. Yeah, I I didn't see I was surprised I didn't see Sean's adventure as that clear cut. I expected it to be really simple and follow uh, and follow the adventure easily. But I have a little different take on the call to adventure. But why don't you fill in the blanks and take us there? All right. Well, call to adventure. Where the hero is presented with a challenge which renders him unable to continue living in the comfort of the ordinary world. I thought the world of common day segment was a little long in this film. It's like 20 minutes ish. Hmm. where, you know, we see Sean at work and that first scene where Liz and Sean are talking and and she's saying she's bored and doesn't want to go to the Winchester every night. And they had an anniversary. Their three-year anniversary was the the previous week. And where did they go? The Winchester. And And so she wants to do something fun. And so he... He says, all right, I'll, I'll take you out for a nice dinner. We'll go to the place that does all the fish, which, by the way, when he opens the phone book and finds, right. first of all, phone phone book. Right, yeah. When he opens the phone book and his finger lands on the page, the, the ads literally says the place that does all the fish. <laughs> yeah, it's great. But he screws that up. He yeah. He forgets to book the table and they're all full by the time he gets home from work and realizes his mistake. Yeah. And he says, why don't we go to the Winchester again? And she hangs up on him. And later she breaks up with him. She's done. She says, if I don't do something now, I'm going to end up in that pub for the rest of my life. Sean and Ed meet at the pub that night, of course, because that's where they always go. And Ed's trying to cheer him up. They go back home drunk and they're listening to <laughs> very loud music. And the third roommate, Pete, played by Peter Serafinowicz, who is great, I think. And what I saw as a an early mentor moment, Pete is yelling at Sean to get rid of Ed because all he ever does is hold you back. Stop defending him, Sean. All he ever does is hold you back. Or does it make your life easier having someone around who's more of a loser than you are? What's that supposed to mean? You know what I mean. I assume it was Liz who did the dumping. Sort your life out, mate. That is partially the call to adventure. But what solidified it for me was just after that, Sean stumbles into the kitchen drunk. He grabs a Sharpie pen and he writes on their little whiteboard on the refrigerator. Cut to morning and he wakes up and he sees what he's written on the board. Go round mums. Get Liz back sort life out. That's what I saw as Sean's call to adventure, because those are the three things that govern his actions for the rest of the film. I think we're, we have some overlap here. Some of what you're calling the world of common day, I have in call to adventure. So I think the adventure here is Sean doing something active with his life, breaking out of his zombie routine. So I see I see the call to adventure coming from many places. The the first, you identified correctly my first call to adventure, which is Liz saying, please, let's do something different. Take me somewhere else. Let's stop going to the Winchester. Break out of this cycle of your life. And then his stepdad, Philip, played oh, brilliantly yeah. by Bill Nye. Absolutely. I haven't yet seen a role that Bill Nye's in where he didn't almost steal the movie. He's just <laughs> so great. Uh, Philip pleads with him, bring flowers for your mom. Don't forget to come tomorrow. And then, like you said, Pete, sort your life out, mate. And even his co-workers, right, are taunting him. He yes. He's the second in command, and he has no authority. And there's this great moment where his younger co-worker, Noel, 
is like talking on the phone, totally disrespecting Sean. He answers a cell phone call in the middle of a staff meeting. Yeah. Oh, and this is where Sean gets the little red ink on his shirt, like foreshadowing all the blood <laughs> that's going to come in this movie, right? Great visual thing. Yep. And he says to Noel, he's trying to bro down with him, hey, I, I don't want to be here forever either. I've got things I want to do too. And Noel looks at him and says, when? And that's another call to adventure from his lousy, rude coworker. Also, Sean is a terrible salesperson. <laughs> he's all he's standing there with customers. He's like flipping the channels. Oh, this has got the sports package. I don't know what that is. <laughs> he's just like, I wouldn't buy anything from this guy. It all represents the the zombification of modern mundane life, though. That's that's what all of that is. Absolutely. And and it's funny, I, I'm bad at recognizing the worth of a title. It hit me after watching this movie twice. Oh, Shaun of the Dead. That's of course. He's one of the walking dead in this in this common day. And his adventure is to come back to life, essentially. So that brings us to refusal of the call. Where the hero's confronted with the unknown and they refuse to go on the adventure. And there's the refusal from without, which is external forces trying to keep the hero from entering the adventure. And then there's refusal from within, where the hero rejects the call. So I see both here. The refusal from within is that Sean is outwardly agreeable to Liz and to her friends and to Philip and Pete, but he cannot seem to break out of his routine. He's got major life inertia. He fails to, to follow through on anything. And then when he does finally try, too late, forces rise up against him. He tries to book the restaurant. They don't have any tables. And then there's a moment a little bit later, refusal from without. Once the zombies are starting to appear and confront Sean, the newscaster says, everyone should stay in their homes and make no attempt to reach your loved ones. That's an announcement, right, that he shouldn't go out. And then... Another moment of refusal from within is, you know, the, the zombies are in the garden and Ed wants to leave. Let's get out of here. And Sean says, no, if we stay here, we're safe. So he's refusing to go out. So that's what I saw as refusal. Yeah, I, I agreed with that. I, I thought I saw a, a refusal from within and it's not an active refusal because <laughs> Sean is a living zombie of the modern world, but it is a representation of the refusal from within is the second time we see his morning routine, he leaves the flat, walks across the street to the convenience store, buys a soda and an ice cream for Ed. And this is the second path, the second time we've seen him do this exact same path. And he's completely oblivious right? that there is destruction around him and there are zombies in the street now. Yeah. He's not at all aware of what's going on. It's a great parody, too, of zombie movies where, you know, the characters noticed all these signs and the tension is mounting. And Sean's just like, doop -er -doop -er -doop, <laughs> walking through all of it. That brings us to the meeting with the mentor or supernatural aid. Where the hero receives counsel on how to operate in the special world. You had mentioned this as refusal from without. Uh, newscaster Jeremy Thompson, who's actually a, a British newscaster, huh. he says, It is vital that you stay in your homes, make no attempt to reach loved ones, and avoid all physical contact with the assailants. I also saw this as mentor, counsel on how to operate in the special world of the zombie invasion now. These are huh. you know instructions from a higher authority. In, from Sean's perspective, because he even takes that. Right. Ed says, let's go, when you, you mentioned the girl the girl in the garden and, and the other bigger zombie that, that joins her. Yeah. And Ed says, let's go, let's, we can take them. And Sean says, no, the man on TV said we should stay home. I saw that as mentor energy, the newscaster. I'll buy it. And that's kind of other, otherwise it, other than, other than Pete, when he dresses Sean down earlier... Yes. I saw one other piece of mentorship. And like the newscaster, it's essentially bad advice for the adventure that Sean is on, right? It's not counsel that helps him achieve his goal. 
Newscaster says, stay inside, be safe. But Sean needs to break out. He needs to take risks. He needs to go rescue his loved ones. And there's another element of supernatural aid where the, the hero receives a weapon, a lightsaber, a magic wand. So I saw another meeting with the mentor as Ed giving Sean bad advice. After the breakup, they go to the bar, they have drinks, and Ed says to him, I'm not going to give you a cliche, but I am going to say it's not the end of the world. <laughs> and of course, it is the end of the world. But this is when Ed points out the rifle over the bar yep. that becomes the magic weapon that allows Sean to keep them alive later in the story. So I saw that as the only kind of passing down as the weapon trope in that moment. That's a great call, yeah. Another moment from the newscaster that I forgot to mention is, and it it actually informs how Ed and Sean deal with the situation that comes. The newscaster says, The attackers can be stopped by removing the head or destroying the brain. I'll repeat that by removing the head or destroying the brain. That brings us to crossing of the threshold. The hero must pass a barrier to enter the special world. And this crossing represents the hero's commitment to taking on the adventure. So I saw the crossing here as a sequence of Sean having his first confrontation with the zombies and then leaving the house to go rescue Mom and Liz, both the women in his life who he has been neglecting. So Ed points out there's a girl in their garden, and it's Mary from the market. It's the checkout girl from the beginning sequence <laughs> right. at, the, at the grocery store. And in fact, that was the first time I realized, oh, like every bit player in the beginning of the movie shows up again as a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> so zombie girl attacks and they impale her, but she doesn't die. And this is when they realize something's not right here. Also, Ed has a fun saver camera. <laughs> and he's taking photos. And I thought that was another techno moment, right? <laughs> fun, your, your camera didn't have a phone back then. So you had fun savers. That was only 16 years ago. Wow. You just, you just said that backwards, but it was applicably funny you said your camera didn't have a phone back then <laughs> <laughs> wow and then they get the news update and they realize oh my god this is what's happening and then they go back outside and they intentionally attack the two zombies in the garden right and they grab the shovel and the cricket bat and they kill their first zombies that's really the moment when they declare themselves enemies of the zombies but the real final crossing to me is Sean has a pee and he washes his hands and he looks up in the mirror and he realizes he has his sales advisor name tag on and he takes it off. And to me, that was a moment where he says, that's my old life. Here's my new life. And this, the name of the store is on the name tag and it says 4A or 4E Electric. And I saw 4A and I thought, oh, maybe that's French for 4A. And I looked it up and the word 4A means... The first definition, a sudden or irregular invasion or attack for war or spoils. And the second definition is an initial and often tentative attempt to do something in a new or different field or area of activity. And I was like, no way. Was that intentional? But it turns out that foray uh, is just the French word for drilled. So, Well, it's also a reference to Ken Forey who is an actor who was in some of the Romero films. Oh, triple, quadruple meaning people. Wow. I liked that sequence of, uh, you know, Sean in the bathroom. He pees. He's eliminating impurities from within himself. He washes his face, eliminating impurities from his external. And then he throws his name tag down. Mm. As you said, casting off like his old skin, his old moment. This is when he transforms from... Sean of Forey Electronics to Sean of the Dead. Yes. Oh, there's a parallel moment. You know, earlier he's in the bathroom. He closes the cabinet and sees the reflection of his roommate. And of course, this happens here again, only it's right. the shadow behind the shower curtain. Yeah. Edgar Wright is such a good director. There's so many little parallels and the details are amazing. And I love all the swish pan cuts. <laughs> right. When he and Ed are making their plans for how they're going to rescue Mom and Liz, that style 
was so satisfying yep. and so funny, and it really broke up the horror for me. So that helped me get over my stressed out zombie terror. I actually ended this segment with them leaving the house. Because they're literally crossing the threshold of the apartment. Yeah, and they're entering the special world of <laughs> a London infested with zombies. So that concludes Act 1. Let's take our first break, and I'll join you at the Virtual Campbell Cafe for side quests. Welcome to the Campbell Cafe. I have no coffee. Yeah, I was going to say, you look kind of zombified. Uh, Maybe have a free glass of water? <laughs> I do have... You don't charge for that. I do have a bottle of water. Bottle of water. There you go. Whoa. What have you been watching, reading, playing? I read a novel called The Last Buccaneer by Matthew Pearl. This is about a bookseller in London who has a little book stall on the street. And he becomes involved with the secretive, sort of underground, not entirely legal, buccaneers, which is a profession of mostly men and one woman who go around absconding with manuscripts from famous authors and selling them to publishers. <laughs> like unpublished manuscripts? Yes. And this apparently was a real problem back in earlier centuries where an author would lose a lot of money because somebody had stolen their, <laughs> their manuscript and sold it to a publisher without... And that's why copyright uh, law came into play. So that's actually an element of, of time pressure on this novel because this book in, this bookseller and the buccaneer that recruits him, they are trying to find Robert Louis Stevenson who has exiled himself to a Samoan island for the last days of his life and so that he can write his last book. So they want to find him and steal his manuscript and get it back to London and sell it to a publisher before the copyright law goes into effect in July of 1781, I think it was. Wow. So so they, they sell them under... Or 1881. Like, a, they sell them under a pseudonym or they sell them as the writer? They didn't have to do that. There was no law protecting the author. They could just go in and say, I'm... I'm Chuck McGillicuddy, and I've got Charles Dickens' latest novel here for you, and how much are you going to pay me for it? Oh, so they, they sell them as a manuscript written by the famous author. They don't steal the manuscript and sell them, like, under a pseudonym or something. Yeah, the point is that it's a famous author. They're going to get more money out of the stolen manuscript gotcha. if it's actually Charles Dickens' manuscript and not... Because who the hell is Chuck McGillicuddy? That's fascinating. It was a fun story. The The conclusion went somewhere I didn't really care for, but up until that point, I thought the, the whole novel was a, just a really fun read. I like reading books about books, <laughs> that kind of thing. Very meta. How about you, Jeffrey? I watched Willow last night uh, with my kids. Our Saturday night movie was Willow, and I loved it. I forgot how much I loved that movie. It's so exciting. And there's a lot of parts that are kind of bad, but it was really fun. Med Mardigan and the battles are just awesome. I've been watching with my wife Cobra Kai, which was an original YouTube series a couple of years ago, and now it's on Netflix. And it is essentially a sequel to The Karate Kid. Daniel LaRusso is grown up, and he's a car dealer who uses his karate as his sort of sales gimmick. <laughs> and uh, Johnny Lawrence is an alcoholic, sort of washed up, working as a handyman. Um, but one night he's sitting outside his convenience store and this kid is getting picked on and he intervenes and does, you know, all this karate and fights off, I think, like five other kids. And the kid he defends 
basically begs him to teach him karate. So he ends up reopening the Cobra Kai dojo. And it's kind of flipped because you're kind of rooting for Johnny Lawrence, who was the bad guy in Karate Kid, because Daniel LaRusso is kind of like a jackass now. It's kind of like a, <laughs> he, you don't like him. So Daniel LaRusso has always been a jackass. I have said, I'm a huge fan of the Karate Kid movies, but that kid deserves every beating he ever got. Wow, that's a different take. <laughs> um, so this must be very satisfying for you as a comeuppance for Daniel LaRusso. In any case, it's I've never seen a show like it. It's all the original actors, and I loved it. Can't wait to finish season one. That's cool. I'm excited that it's on Netflix because I I didn't have YouTube Red, and and now that it's on Netflix, I can watch it. And I like I just said, I'm a huge fan of the Karate Kid movies. So yeah, I I want to watch it after I finish Dark. So. And then I read something in a genre that I've I don't think I've ever read before. I read a YA romance novel by my friend Amy Spaulding. I don't think I've ever read a romance novel in, in, unless you count like Wuthering Heights or Sense and Sensibility. This was it was so much fun. It was a light, entertaining sort of meet cute, which I, I really needed something light and funny. The main character is Abby. She's a 17 year old fashion blogger. She wants to be like a designer when she grows up. And she's like she's always been the sidekick in other people's adventures. She pictures her. She pictures herself as like the best friend in the romantic comedy, never the main character. And then she lands an internship at a local fashion boutique where the promise is if you intern, you'll get hired for a part time job in the summer. But instead, she has to compete with another intern, uh, Jordi Perez, who is not only ultra cool, but she's also ultra attractive. And Abby totally falls in love with her and hijinks ensue. And I didn't I wasn't aware of this, but there's a subgenre of romance called Happily Ever After or H E A. And it's oh, it's like a promise to the reader. It's it's a promise to the reader that it'll end well. Because apparently readers they romance readers want to know ahead of time. They don't want a breakup book. They want a happily ever after book. Um so but it was weird because even though I knew it was happily ever after, when they break up, as they, you know, of course, you know, girl meets girl, girl breaks up with girl, I was like, oh no. I was just tense and I wanted them to end up together. Uh, but it was really great. It's called The Summer of Jordi Perez and the Best Burger in Los Angeles by Amy Spaulding. It was fun. Doesn't that ruin the experience of reading the novel if you already know how it's going to turn out? Well, like I said, that was my fear. And yet when it got to girl breaks up with girl, I was still compelled to read on. So I think readers of romance, they have an expectation about what they're about to read. You know, if you if you're a comedy fan, you want the comedy to be funny. If you're a horror fan, you want it to be horrifying. I guess it's it's like this with this subgenre of romance where. You know, a romance reader wants it to end well. It's not like a drama, right? It's like, you know, kind of like a rom, a Hollywood rom-com. There's an expectation. Um, so it's not really about whether they get together in the end. It's about how. And uh, I enjoyed it. I was able to suspend my disbelief and, uh, and fear for the couple and then, you know, feel the catharsis when they end up together. Dan, let's, uh, let's finish our coffee. I don't have coffee. <laughs> I have coffee. <laughs> I like we'll coffee. head back to Studio Z. <laughs> it's gonna be okay now. I like coffee. Act two begins with the road of trials or tests, allies, and enemies. Having crossed the first threshold, the hero meets allies, makes enemies, and must pass a series of tests to prove their worthiness. We've already met Ed. I waffle on Ed. Sometimes he's funny and sometimes he annoys the crap out of me. He's highly inappropriate. He's he's crass and crude. And, I mean, he, do, he's, he does this fart joke. And yeah. he's... <laughs> I don't know. He's like, he's like the, the, I guess he does and says things that, like you were saying in previous episodes, the allies often represent facets of the hero that we don't actually see from the hero. So maybe Ed is the, does and says things that Sean wishes he could. Yeah. I don't know. 
He's he for sure tickles Sean. That's one thing that's clear is that Sean loves the guy and yeah. he feels like he needs him in his life. Yeah, but he's got no job. He just sits around. He, he apparently sleeps on the couch. And uh, other than that, he plays PlayStation all day. Yeah, what a life. I'm sure uh, I'm sure Sean would love to be able to do that. Uh, other allies, I think Liz, even though Liz breaks up with Sean, right. she, she certainly becomes an ally in the, the survival aspect of, of the adventure. Yeah, even even her breakup is almost in support of Sean getting his together. Yes, that's a good point. Liz has two roommates, Diane and David. I see Diane <laughs> yes. absolutely as an ally. David, though, yeah. is an antagonist throughout. Yeah, I agree. He is secretly in love with Liz and takes every opportunity he can to poke Sean in the ribs about the breakup. He's tracked their anniversary and when it is and the fact that Sean missed it. That's like, hmm. Right. I see Barbara as an ally. Sean's mother, who's just super kind, even though Sean and her husband, who is Sean's stepfather, Philip, played by Bill Nye, yeah. they don't get along, and they haven't for the 17 years that Philip and Barbara have been married. They've always had a, an adversarial relationship, apparently. Yeah. But Philip is a shapeshifter. He starts off as s- sort of like the authority figure for Sean, but there's something... There's something there in that first conversation when Sean, when Philip is in the electronics store reminding Sean that their bi-monthly visit is the next day and don't forget to bring the flowers that you forgot to bring your mother on Mother's Day. And then he kind of half smiles and says, well, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow then. There's just something like Phil- yeah. Philip is trying. He knows that there's animosity between them, but this is him like really trying to reach out. Yeah, he's invested in the relationship. Enemies, all, uh, I mean, of course, all the Zeds. Right. <laughs> the Zeds, yes. Can't say the word. All right, so tests. Sean and Ed essentially steal Pete's car, and Ed has always wanted to drive Pete's car, and he might not <laughs> get another chance, so this is his opportunity. <laughs> And man, he's just, yep. he is taking advantage of this op- this one chance that he's got to drive Pete's car and he's driving like a madman. And Sean, this is Sean's, this is Sean's first test with Ed. He's trying to get Ed to calm down, slow down, quit driving like a crazy person. Let's get to mom's alive. Right. And uh, sort of like the dude and Walter Sobchak where the dude cannot make Walter behave. Sean is unable to control Ed in this case. Maybe that's why he's friends with Ed, because, you know, Sean is locked into, you know, just following the rules and going along the track. And Ed doesn't care. He's a risk taker. He does whatever he wants. He doesn't care about the rules, doesn't care about rent or cleaning up or making anybody happy but himself. The second test is at mom's house. Sean is trying to get his mother to come with him so that they can go to a safe place. But... She's unwilling to leave because Philip has been bitten because some men tried to get into the house earlier. And they mm-hmm. they were a bit bitey, as she says. <laughs> oh, Barbara. Sean wants to take us somewhere. Don't be silly. I'm not going anywhere. Well, maybe you should stay here. You know, wait for the doctor and I'll take Mum. But you said the doctor wasn't coming. You didn't call the doctor, did you? Well, I thought we ought to be on the safe side. I'm quite all right, Barbara. I ran it under a cold tap. I really and agree. so she wants to wait with her husband. Sean is trying to get her to get out of the house, though. And he plays on that antagonistic relationship that he and Philip has and speaks the most grievous lie to his mother when he's oh. when he's trying to turn his mother against Philip and he says yeah. did you know that on several occasions he touched me oh come and on, then John. it takes him about 2 seconds to go that wasn't true i just made that up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but his his but barbara lights into him she shows a fan. For it, yeah. Mom, you don't understand. Her. No, it's you that doesn't understand. Philip is my husband and has been for the last 17 years. I know you haven't always seen eye to eye, but I would at least expect you to respect my feelings. Also, Sean comes there with the intention of killing Philip. Like, it's not just he's trying to convince mom to leave without him. He wants to, the plan is to kill him. Right, yeah. Well, because he's a, you know, he's going to be a Zed, so gotta got to eliminate yeah. him. But he hasn't turned yet. 
Sean has another physical test in the driveway when a zombies attack as they're all getting into the Jag. Uh, Phillips Jaguar that Ed is very excited about driving. Ed just wants to drive everybody's car, yeah. apparently. And he, he totally wrecks Pete's car yeah. on purpose so he can drive the Jag. So th- this is a an, another you know physical test against a bunch of zombies who are attacking the group. Philip is bitten again. Mm. Why don't you take a couple of tests? Because uh, my throat's getting dry, and I don't know if it's oncoming zombification or if I just need some water. I think it's lack of coffee. So I, I'd say the next test is rescuing Liz. The threshold guardian here are David and Diane, and they don't want to let Sean in because Liz doesn't want to see him. <laughs> right. So he climbs up the side of the building and gets in there, and then he has to persuade Diane and David and Liz to come with him, to leave the safety of their apartment, and he he succeeds, and then he gets them all crammed into the car, and that's what I see as the final test before the approach. I shifted my ordeal halfway through my analysis, and I think, given that that's your last test, I think I originally had the same ordeal that you're about to go with. Interesting. Huh, interesting. Interesting has become code on this podcast with disagreeing. I'm not so sure I agree with you, but... (laughs) Exactly. That takes us to approach to the inmost cave, where the hero reaches the edge of a dangerous place where the object of his quest is hidden. So to me, the approach here is Sean leading his party to the Winchester, where he thinks they'll be safe, but where, unbeknownst to Sean, a whole bunch of hell is about to break loose. Now we've got Sean and Ed and Mum and Philip and Liz and Diane and David <laughs> packed into Philip's Jaguar, <laughs> and they are headed to the Winchester. They are approaching the cave. And this is, there's this tender scene with Philip. And, you know, a recurring trope in approach is a reckoning among allies or a love scene. And while they're not obviously romantic, Philip is knows he's dying and sort of has a deathbed confession to Sean, you know, I, I always loved you. I just wanted to be your dad. I wanted to make you grow up and not give up because you lost your dad. And Sean, by the way, Simon Pegg, what an actor. He is hilarious, but he's emotionally connected in these moments. I'd forgotten how much I love him. I want to go back and watch. I'm going to have a Simon Pegg film festival because he is <laughs> he's great. So they have this tender scene. And then, of course, Philip dies. They have this battle to get out of the car so that Philip doesn't bite them or zombified Philip doesn't bite them. And this is the one little plot hole I had in the movie because they're in the intersection. They're surrounded by zombies. Wouldn't it be easier to battle one zombie and Philip and push him out of the car and maintain their vehicle? But instead, they run away from the car and set off on foot. The stakes are up. The risk is higher. And... Sean says, we're going to take a shortcut. We're going to go over all these garden fences. So they're hopping garden fences, and Sean looks over the last one, and he sees a giant horde of zombies standing between them and the Winchester. So in place of the traditional preparing for battle scene, Diane gives them all an acting lesson (laughs) so that they can impersonate zombies. Right, that's all. Shake out, get nice and limber. Now, take another look at the way he moves. Remember, very limp. Almost like sleepwalking. Look at the face. It's vacant with a hint of sadness. Like a drunk who's lost a bed. Okay, let's try, shall we? And that's what I saw as approach to the inmost cave. Yeah, a function of the approach is doing reconnaissance on the enemy. And I, I saw Sean taking the one, two, three steps up the kitty slide to look over the fence and then one, two, three steps <laughs> down. That's <laughs> reconnaissance on the enemy. For sure. And then another function is like getting into the enemy's head. And that is Diane's acting lesson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we we are actually in agreement there. How interesting. Okay, good. I I did not expect that. We synced up. So that brings us to the ordeal where the hero faces the ultimate test, often risking death to overcome his worst fear, sometimes actually appearing to die. So play acting as zombies, Sean and company stumble down the street toward the Winchester. And I I know I know I'm interrupting you here, Dan. I know I'm interrupting. This scene was almost unwatchable for me. What? It is was so terrifying for me to put myself 
in their shoes and be walking through a horde of zombies knowing that if I messed up once they would just come in on me I was <laughs> I, I checked my Fitbit and my heart was going like 95 and I was sweat I, like I'm serious I, this scene was so terrifying that when I watched it a second time I just skipped past it I was like nope wow nope. fast forward so this couldn't that I this was an ordeal oof, for this you was my ordeal yeah <laughs> yes it was it really was so they reach the front door of the Winchester successfully, but it's locked. I'm going to leave while you talk about this. I just got, I'm like, you, if you could see me, listeners, I'm like twitching and squirming. This is so but, tense for me. What's my, what's my, <laughs> what's my heart rate right now? I got to check it. So you have this scene of the party trying to figure out how to get in the Winchester as the zombies in the street begin to realize that might be food there, not zombies because they're starting to talk they're starting to break character and uh, and it, and then flipping ed his cell phone rings and he answers it oh ed. ed ed and the zombies are creeping in they're creeping in they're creeping closer uh, people are starting to panic sean confronts ed finally about yes. being a screw up and just as Sean is about to tell the group that there's a back door to the Winchester that they can go check, David chucks a trash can <laughs> through the window. That noise sets everything in motion. Sean has I what I think is his apotheosis moment when, and I, I, yeah. I went back to the text, the hero risks individual life for the sake of the larger collective life. So Sean it's in the scripture. Sean gets all the zombies' attention and then runs away to draw all the zombies yeah. away so that his group can climb through the broken window into the Winchester. That's what I saw as the end of the ordeal. We are 100% in sync. Holy here. smoke. I just wanted to point out one little like character motivation thing. Yeah. You know at the beginning of the movie David is kind of higher up than Sean on the prestige list because Sean is not on Liz's good list. She He is in her bad books, and David is sort of self-righteous about it. And then Sean, as soon as Sean starts stepping up as a leader and he actually gets them there, David is now scrambling for prestige to try and impress Liz because Liz is starting to treat Sean like the leader. And yep. I think that's why... That's why he smashes the win. I'm going to take charge. I'm going to be the one to solve the problem. And of course, it goes horribly wrong. Absolutely. Yes. Well, that brings us to reward, the ultimate boon. I struggle with the ultimate boon as a thing. I think I need to look up the word boon again. But this is where the hero, having <laughs> faced their worst fear, seizes the object of their quest. Well, the object of the quest here was to get to the Winchester and to impress Liz. Agreed. So in so much as that is a boon, he has achieved it. Sean shows up in the pub. He's not dead. He has appeared to die and come back to life. Classic ordeal and reward. So they've made it to the Winchester safely. More or less, minus Philip. And Sean has impressed Liz. Nice of you to join us. Yeah, well, promised, didn't I? She's starting to see him as the guy she wanted him to be, the guy who does get out and do things. And a traditional part of the reward is a campfire scene um, where the, the heroes recharge and refuel and rest before the big battle. And instead of the campfire, they're sitting around a pub table eating pig snacks and drinking and waiting either for rescue or for zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and that's what I saw as the reward. In a real show of leadership, when Sean is revealed to be alive, he immediately starts asking, is everyone okay? What's the situation? Do we have a phone? Mm. Is there power? Like he's, he's assessing the environment. Yeah. I think it starts to fall apart you included this as part of the reward is the, uh, as the campfire scene of everyone resting and recharging. But when they're all sitting around the pub table, their demeanor is very low. Yeah, it starts to shift there. And we have cut from daytime to nighttime right after Liz says to Sean, so what's the plan? As Sean is drinking his beer and then his, he like, his cheeks bug out. And his eyes bug out mm -hmm. and he realizes 
there is no plan after this. I th- I saw that as the beginning of the road back, where Sean is now confronted mm. again with having to make decisions, and he hadn't planned this far ahead. I'll buy that. But we are at the end of Act 2. Just like Sean earned his beer by getting them to the Winchester, I think we've earned ours. You, we sure have. So let's have our beverage break at the Winchester. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as Sean and company, at this point in the film, sit in the Winchester Tavern, here we, too, have our beverages. This is one of the reasons I love doing this show. It is Sunday, 1044 a.m., but for (laughs) the sake of the show, I mean, we have to do, we've got to do the beverage break. We even cut it out of the the show for a few episodes and received a massive amount of feedback asking for us to put it back in. So we're we've got to make the sacrifice here. That's right. I had a a surprisingly difficult time finding something that I felt was appropriate for this film. When they're in the Winchester, I paused while the the beer taps were on screen. Oh, good idea. And the ones that were visible were, are not beers that are available here. I don't even know if they were real beers or not, because I, I was not familiar with them. So I went to the liquor store and just looked for... I figured, you know, it's late September as we're recording this, and I figured they might have some kind of Halloween-themed beer. Maybe one of them's got a zombie on the label, stuff like that. I couldn't find anything. And then I remembered a line in the film, and it's at this point in the film, too, when they're in the Winchester and they're prepping for the final battle, Sean says to everybody, As Bertrand Russell once said, the only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. I think we can all appreciate the relevance of that now. And Sean starts to walk away, and Liz comes up to him and says, Did you read that off of a beer mat? And he says, Yeah, Guinness Extra Cold. So... Extra cold was not available, but I do have Guinness Extra Stout. I, too, looked up Guinness Extra Cold, and it's not available in the United States. So I, too, brought home a six-pack of Guinness Extra Stout <laughs> <laughs> because I, I love Guinness, and I wanted one. Yeah. But what I got instead is Undead Party Crasher Imperial Stout from Clown Shoes Brewing. Wow! And what it says on the can is, Undead beware, the undead party crasher cares not for your festivities of the evil afterlife. (laughs) Thou hast been vanquished before, and I shall vanquish thee again. Our big and bold Imperial Stout utilizes holy water (laughs) and a malt bill including smoked malts for imperial stout that bursts with dark malt flavor. Rich notes of coffee and chocolate mingle throughout an intense and full-bodied stout. Wow. Dan, even though a British pint is technically 20 ounces, and this is only a 16-ounce can, and it's an American imperial stout, but it does have imperial, so it's a British imperial. (laughs) Um, This is only a 16-ounce can, but it clocks in at 9% ABV, so... We gonna have a good act three. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, comparatively, Guinness is low alcohol. It is, I have an 11.2 ounce bottle and it is only 5.6% alcohol. So So I'm drinking more than twice the alcohol as you are. Yeah. I'm gonna get sloppy and your tolerance is higher. I don't know, I've been pretty intolerant lately. (laughs) <laughs> Tell me about your beer. Well, every every Guinness, Guinness Stouts anyway, I know they've started making lagers and things. Well, okay, no, Harp, Harp Lager is made by them, and they've, they've that's always been a lager. But I'm talking about in the United States, they've made Guinness American Lager and yeah. things like that that actually have the Guinness brand name on it. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, it, I mean... If you've if you've ever had a Guinness before, you know exactly what this looks like. It is dark as motor oil, and I, I've already I've already consumed the uh, the top fifth of this, <laughs> but uh, so there's no head on it anymore. But there was a good inch of nice foamy head, and it just smells like a Guinness. How is your beer? You haven't even poured it yet, son. I haven't cracked it, but you haven't told us how does it taste and how is it different than Guinness non-extra stout. 
Um, this is a little bit bitter, but just a slight touch. It's not bitter like an IPA. It's just a, it's just a little twang of bitterness, but it still has that nutty, roasty, chocolatey flavor to it. If I had to choose only one beer to drink for the rest of my life, it would be Guinness. Is that right? Unlike other beers, it doesn't leave me feeling headachy. It's always the right beer. And I had a Guinness Extra Stout last night, and I thought it actually tasted a little molassesy, molassesy compared to regular Guinness. And the other thing that I don't like about the Extra Stout is that it doesn't have the nitro canister in it, because I love pouring a Guinness into a glass at home and having, getting that nitro head. It's just so special. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to crack open my Clown Shoes Undead Party Crasher American Imperial Stout. Here we go. I'm really excited that you found that. I have to be careful here. Oh, wow. I don't know if you can see, but it has a very Guinness-like cascading foamy head. And the head isn't like a creamy white, like a Guinness. It is very chocolatey brown. Oh, man, it smells like chocolate. I'm going to take a foamy sip and give myself a head mustache. Wow. Coffee and chocolate is right. That is very chocolatey. And the coffee note goes perfect with the coffee I haven't finished yet. Take another sip. <laughs> You're just really rubbing it in that you have coffee and I don't. Man, that's easy drinking. Did you just get the one or does it come in a six pack or what's the... It came in a four pack for sixteen ninety nine. This is not a cheap beer. Yeah, yeah. But it, it'll do the job of two, so... <laughs> it, yeah, if it's almost 10% ABV. If you have the means, pick yourself up a four pack of Undead Party Crasher. This is good stuff. Where is Clown Shoes based? Are they... Boston, Massachusetts is where it's canned okay and windsor vermont i remember them having really interesting label art yeah the can has it's in some kind of industrial building and our hero is in jacket pants with a big utility belt he's holding a crossbow (laughs) and there are two big zombies one looks like frankenstein lumbering after him and then there's some kind of a goblin in the corner (laughs) <laughs> with long green ears. I'm not sure what that's about. A goblin. Yeah, it's like a little goblin. I'll put. I'll post a photo. Weird. This is great. I love it. Yeah, make sure you take a picture of that for, for the website. The elixirs section. All right, well, I'm going to be drinking this for the next hour because it's powerful. <laughs> yeah. Barkeep, can I get this to go? You put it in a sippy cup? A little sippy cup. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's stumble back home and finish Act 3 of Shaun of the Dead. Act three of the hero's journey begins with the road back where the hero is pursued by vengeful forces he disturbed when he claimed his reward. So the survivors have gained entry to the Winchester. Sean has miraculously returned after being chased by hundreds of zombies through the streets of London. And as they're sitting there in the dark, the streetlights outside flicker on. And Sean realizes it's not the power grid that's out. It's just the power in the building that's out. So I'm just going to go and flip the breakers. And then we can turn on the television and see what's happening on the news. Get some updates. And while Sean is fixing the breakers, he turns on the outside lights real quick. And he sees through the window that the zombies have followed him back to the Winchester. (laughs) Ugh. And he flips the light off real quick, and he draws the oh. shade on, the, <laughs> as though that's going to uh, deter, right. deter them. Oh, suddenly there's a shade drawn over the window. We can't get in. <laughs> and honestly, the silhouette of zombies at the window is always more terrifying than the actual zombies. So I gotta, I gotta argue. Sean made a poor choice there, <laughs> even though it was dark when he pulled the shade. Back in the main room of the Winchester. They're flipping through the television channels, and every single one of them says, no signal, await further instructions. Yeah. There is no news. This situation is now widespread. It is very clear to them that this is a probably a national, maybe even a worldwide issue. 
And again, if this were 2020, everyone would be checking their phones and the writers would have to come up with some reason why there was no, you know, there'd have to be no cell signal or something. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, there would be this sequence of everyone going, I don't have a signal either. And then panic sets on their faces. But in this case, it's the flipping through every single channel and there's no content. Actually, you know what? Ed received a phone call right outside the Winchester. So he should have been able to call somebody inside, and they never dealt with that. Loose end, Edgar and Simon. (laughs) No, no. Sean slapped the phone out of Ed's hand, and it hit the pavement, so it probably broke his phone. You're right. Sean ruined their chances of survival. Nice work, Sean. All right. What really sets things in motion here, though, is Ed turning on that stupid arcade game. And then the zombies start slapping their hands up against the window, and you start hearing that dreadful moaning and groaning as they claw at the glass, trying to get into the Winchester at the tasty morsels of meat and blood inside. So I... I freeze framed to look at that machine and it says Dracula on it. And I thought, yeah, it must be an arcade game. But there's a shot where a bunch of quarters drop into a big metal pan like a slot machine. So I don't know what the hell that thing was. Yeah, I was trying to look at that, too. At first, I thought it was maybe like a pinball machine or something. But then I saw yeah, all right. the coins pop out. I'm like, oh, is it like a jackpot thing or? So, yeah, British listeners. Do you have slot machines in your pubs? Uh, Tweet at us or put a comment on the website or something. Let us know if that's a thing. Now, if there was any doubt, the zombies are aware that there is food inside this building. And they are clawing at every window, pounding on every door. And this is where everything starts to go bad for the group. John, the proprietor of the Winchester, arrives, <sighs> but he's a zombie. So there's the, there's a yeah. there's a little battle with him as the jukebox has flickered to life and is now playing Queen at maximum volume, and <laughs> and Sean and Liz and Ed are fighting zombie John off with pool cues. David goes back to the breakers to try to turn off the power to kill the jukebox, but he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's, like, flipping switches on and off, and he's causing all the lights on the outside to flicker, and it's like a dance party with all the zombies. So they finally defeat Zombie John, and as the group sort of reassembles and comes up with the plan for the final battle, zombies start breaking the windows now. They are now gaining entry to the Winchester. The stakes are constantly being raised here, and this is what has to happen in every zombie movie. Uh, Why do zombies... so uncomfortable. Why do zombies bother you so much? This is so fascinating to me. I personally, I love zombie fiction. I will watch any zombie movie. I probably enjoy zombie movies that are really bad that everybody hates, but I like it just because uh, for some reason, just the zombie mythology and lore, it just really entertains me for some reason. Video I, games, so oh, give them to me. I don't know that I've seen a large number of zombie movies. Shaun of the Dead is my favorite because it's so funny. It interrupts the tension. But we played that game Left for Dead, which is like a cooperative zombie first-person shooter. And I'm okay with those games where you have like a chainsaw and a shotgun and a machine gun and a rocket launcher and you're, you know, the odds are stacked in your favor. But that game, Dying Light, where (laughs) the whole point of the game is to avoid the zombies because they're so brutal and the lights go out and you hear the shrieks and you don't have any weapons and you're, oh, I just, my heart would race. I had to turn off the music on that game and put on like Oingo Boingo to enter. I can't do it, man. I can't do it. I don't know what it is. It freaks me out. I don't want any part of it. I'm never watching The Walking Dead, no no matter how many people tell me it's the best TV show they've ever seen. I'm out. I am out. Wow. That's awesome. Those milky eyes and the, uh, they just shamble. Oh, yeah. Continuing with the road back, continuing with vengeful forces, setbacks for the heroes, 
while Sean is defending the Winchester Tavern with the Winchester rifle, it is revealed that Barbara was bitten by the pajama zombie Mm. earlier. Mm. And there is this heart-wrenching scene of Sean cradling his mother as she dies. And then David actually... I mean, as they say, he he did the right thing, even though he was being a twat. <sighs> Picks up the rifle and aims it at the corpse of Barbara. Yeah. Because he knows she's going to turn into a zombie, and if she does, she'll kill all of us. So we have to shoot her. And there's this great standoff yeah. between David and Ed and Sean and Diane and... It's just this really great but tense scene. And throughout, Simon Pegg, you talked about his performance earlier where he he's he can be funny and goofy, but his performance in these really emotionally distraught scenes is so good. In this yeah. in this scene when he is screaming at David to stop pointing the gun at my mom, he's just like hours before had to sit next to his stepfather as he gave that deathbed confessional and had to have his heart ripped out emotionally to lose his yeah. stepfather now he's lost his mother so the the two parental figures in his life he's lost within a matter of hours and you see, he loses you so much that. in this movie you see that in Simon Pegg's performance he's really good it's a great performance Dan- for this kind of movie you don't expect that that just makes it so much worse because it's so grounded in reality. And that makes the terror of the zombies that much more real because you see what he's losing. And not just right. to lose a parent, but it's almost like when one of your friends finds out that their parent is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and they stop being themselves. You know what I mean? They forget their name. They forget who who their kid is. And it's just so heart-wrenching. That's what becoming a zombie is like. He gets to watch his mom still alive and animated, but not who he remembers her to be. And that that's the real horror of zombies, is that they look like the people you love, but they're not that person anymore. Right. And you're right. Slime and Peg nails it. Also, this standoff... It, they've got broken beer bottles pointed at each other's neck. <laughs> and at one point, Diane is upset because there's nobody threatening Sean. It's Sean and Ed both have broken bottles at <laughs> at David's neck. So Ed breaks a bottle and hands it to Diane so that she can have a bottle <laughs> yeah. at, at Sean's neck to even the odds or something. It's great. <laughs> uh that's like the one that's the one moment where where Ed isn't a complete jackass. Yeah, he has some sense of fairness that kicks in there or something. Yeah, it was it was bizarre, but but entertaining and any that redeemed Ed for me. Yeah. Really really yeah. act 3 is when Ed the entirety of act 3 he redeems himself. Yeah. All right, so man, now Barbara has turned into a zombie. Sean has to shoot her. David and Sean get into a scuffle. Mm-hmm. David gets his hand on the rifle, points it at Sean, and pulls the trigger. But the chamber is empty, and everybody is yeah. absolutely aghast at David for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And David gets up. He's like, that's it. I'm leaving. And Diane's able to talk him down. But David is standing right next to a window. Zombies break the window. <laughs> Grab David, pull him out, and rip him to shreds. Ugh. What a disgusting scene that is. Where, and what great special effects, practical special effects, where you see the zombies and they are like clawing into David's abdomen. Their fingers are digging through and they start pulling him apart. And there's his intestines it is a sickening image especially because david is still alive and he's screaming while it's happening this is when it all falls apart diane david's her boyfriend and she wants to go save him so she opens the door to go outside and rescue him and the zombies just pour in yeah and that is the end of the road back This brings us to resurrection. The hero faces death one more time 
in a final battle or showdown. This time, the danger is on the broadest scale of the entire story. This is the big battle. Zombies rush into the pub. They're closing in on every side. Liz is holding some of them at bay with a hat rack, <laughs> the pub hat rack. Yep. Sean is taking them out with the rifle. Ed's behind the bar making Molotov cocktails, <laughs> which he calls out earlier that they should do that. And he names, he knows by heart all the spirits <laughs> that have enough alcohol content to be flammable. Right. I love that about Ed. Again, he redeems himself, uh-huh, right? Uh-huh. Then zombies are coming in through the back door and roommate Pete comes in and they overwhelm Ed and... Pete gets a bite of his forearm, and then another female zombie bites him on the neck, and Ed is, he's a goner, yeah. right? hes He's been bitten. It's over for yep. Ed. At this point, Liz and Sean are the only ones standing, and they get behind the bar. And then Ed, he makes it. He gets in behind the bar. He's still bitten and done, but he gets behind the bar, and Sean realizes that he's got to make a barrier. So he pours liquor on the bar and lights it up. So now there's a barrier of fire protecting them from the zombies just long enough for them to have a little dialogue. And that's one of the great tropes of a zombie movie, right? Is that there are these respites during the attack where there there can be scenes like the scene between Liz and Barbara where she gives her the necklace that yeah. Sean's father gave her. Oh my yeah. God, that's the scene that got me. Because Barbara's so sweet and unassuming. She knows she's a goner. She knows that Liz is important to him. And she, oh, forget it. Forget, I'm I'm getting to it. Anyway, (laughs) so they're behind the bar, wall of fire. There's no crying in zombie movies. There was a lot of crying for me in this one. So so they're behind the wall of fire. Sean says to Ed, where are the bullets? And Ed goes, they're on the bar. (laughs) And Sean stands up and tries to get him. But of course, it's fire. Everything's too hot. The zombies are starting to come through. They found the bar, you know, the entrance to the back of the bar, and they're coming through. And then the box of shells starts popping like popcorn, yep. and w- one bullet pings off the bar bell and and goes right through the head of the female zombie who's approaching them. So it gives them cover, and they retreat into the cellar. So now they're they're in the cellar and there's another door between them and the zombies. So it's going to take the zombies a while to figure out how to get down there. So they have another brief respite and it turns out they're trapped in the cellar. That the hatch to the outside is locked. They just they sit down on the steps, Sean and Liz, and Ed is leaning up against a box or something and is holding his neck. He's just bleeding and he's on his way out. So they they prepare to die. They're planning you know, they have two bullets left. They're planning who call, would... Call them shells. Sorry, yes. <laughs> they have two shells left. They're trying to figure out, like, well, should I kill you and then I kill myself? And Liz is like, you have to kill me because I'd mess it up. So they're discussing in sort of a morbidly lighthearted way how they're going to end it. Then they spot the remote to the lift and realize there's a way out. And Sean has this tearful goodbye with Ed and leaves in the rifle. And they ascend to street level, armed with a fire axe and a chain. (laughs) Right. And Liz holding the chain is on the movie poster. And I remember seeing that and going, that's badass, (laughs) right? Like, And one of the things I love about this movie is all the weapons are totally weapons from a zombie video game, right? Oh, hell yeah. And they get upgraded. They start with, you know, flinging record albums and toasters, right? Then they upgrade to Cricket Bat. Then they upgrade to, you know, fire, you know, hitting them with a hat rack and a, a fire <laughs> is that extinguisher. Hat rack? Is that an upgrade? Well, I don't know. You're right. It's a weapon of it's a weapon of convenience. And then they get to the rifle and now it's axe and chain. Right. So they get up to street level and they're about to cut their way through zombies when a troop transport truck pulls up, screeches to a halt and soldiers just pile out and start blasting away at the zombies with automatic weapons. And here comes Yvonne with a golf club and they're rescued. And Yvonne has some dialogue that mirrors the beginning. She says, yeah. I'm just glad somebody made it. There's a lot of mirror dialogue in this film. Yes. I, I would recommend you rewatch the film. I don't mean you, Jeff. I mean, listeners, if this isn't a movie that you've seen often, rewatch it again and, and pay attention to all that mirrored dialogue. It's a clever script. It, uh, Yeah. I found a PDF of the screenplay, and I reread a lot of the crucial scenes, and it's a brilliantly written, very efficient screenplay. The stage directions are very simple, and it's just 
if you're an aspiring screenwriter, that's a script worth reading because it is airtight. So that's what I see as the end of Resurrection. That's the end of the big battle. A representation of the resurrection is the hero returning from the underworld to the land of the living. And I think Liz and Sean rising up from the barrel cellar to street level is is a representation of that. The good imagery there. And then I think also there's a resurrection of Sean and Liz because as they are walking away, they reach out to each other and they hold hands. This is moments after Liz has said to Sean, what makes you think I've decided to take you back? Yeah. And Sean says, you don't want to die single, do you? (laughs) Yeah. So great. And that brings us to the final segment of the hero's journey, the freedom to live or return with the elixir. The hero, having won some precious treasure or reward, now returns to the ordinary world to share the spoils of battle. So after the Z-Day crisis, (laughs) we're seeing this in a documentary footage kind of thing. Zombies have been collected and put to work doing menial labor jobs. And and, right. and we see Noel, the the seventeen year old co worker of Sean earlier, the one who answered the phone during the staff meeting. Now he is collecting shopping yeah. carts in a grocery store parking lot. But Sean and Liz are united. They're living in the house that Sean yeah. and Pete and Ed shared. But you can see that it's been put together. the The living room looks nice. There's you know, the the furniture is in a proper place and it's been picked up. There's not Ed garbage all over the place. <laughs> it's it's they've they've like put things back together. Liz and Sean sit on the couch, and now it's Sean saying, What's the plan? And Liz gives the readout of the day. Yeah. And it includes a trip to the pub. What's the plan then? Right, um our cup of tea. Then uh, we'll get this hot date. Head down to Phoenix for a roast. Veg out in the pub for a bit. Then wander home, watch a bit of telly, go to bed. Perfect. So they have assimilated almost. They've figured out their life so that they both get to do the thing they like to do. Well, it's interesting because I took it a step further because it's the laziest day ever. She's like, well, I have tea, read the paper, go to the pub, come home, watch TV, go to sleep. Yeah. That's very much a Sean- It's Sunday. Pre-adventure. It's Sunday, though. But they don't go to a garden. They don't go to a movie. It is exactly Sean's pre-adventure life. And so my mm. take on it was- Liz is actually the one who changes. She's had enough excitement. Sean has proven to her in his, <laughs> you know, in his saving of her <laughs> that he will take charge. So there's no need for them to have a special life. Man, you risked everything. You lost everything to save me. We can have your lazy life now. I'm down. And now she sees the virtue of a simple life. But the film ends. I love the I love the ending of this film. As she goes off to make the tea, he says, I think I'm going to pop into the garden for a minute. And she knows exactly what he's going to go do. She says, all right. And we pop off into the shed where Ed, zombie Ed, has been domesticated, question mark, but he's chained up yeah. in the shed with his PlayStation. He's just <laughs> spending literally the rest of his undead life playing video games just as he did during his real life. But this is a callback to Pete when he was yelling at them and he told Ed, you want to live like an animal? Go live in the shed. Yeah. Oh, I'd forgotten that. Yes. As credits roll, we hear another Queen song. This time, you're my best friend. Yeah. Which applies to Ed and now it applies to Liz. So yes. so Sean Sean really wins. He returns with the elixir because he gets both he gets to have his best friend and he gets the girl back. Yeah. And he has his simple life that he always enjoyed. Well done, Daniel. And that's the end of the journey. That was exhausting. I am dead tired. Or undead tired? Uh. That was not a play zombie moan. That was me reacting to your... In your head. In 
your okay. head. Zombie, zombie, zombie. This is how you're going to honor the memory of Dolores Reardon with that. Hey, please take a moment to go to your podcast app and give The Hero's Journey a five-star rating. It makes a big difference. Also, in addition to all the usual podcast apps, you can listen to The Hero's Journey on YouTube, Spotify, or directly on our website, www.heroesjourneypodcast.com. And please come talk to us on the social medias. We have a great time chatting with fun patrons like Joseph Wilbur and Melanie Nelson. It's like hanging out with friends, only without giving each other a deadly virus. We are at (laughs) Heroes Journey Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and Heroes Podcast on Twitter. And we would like to take this moment to thank our demigod patrons, our very own group of survivors, Misha Calderon... Joseph Wilbur, Chris Bodeker, Both Boys React, Jeff Scott, John Peterson Jr., Ricky Garvin, and Scott Sanford. Shaun of the Dead is copyright 2004, WT Venture, LLC. Well, Jeff, should we uh, pop off to Foreman's for a pint? That's our version of the Winchester. You never take me any place special anymore. I literally just took you to the Vogler Lounge and the Campbell Cafe. It's not enough, Dan. It's not enough. If you leave me now, you'll take away the crap. Until next time. (laughs) Journey on. What's he doing? Just say bass. Or... Freeze. What a tip.